We invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter number 8. We will get our title from verse 16 and then go on to chapter number 9 to take up the fourth blessing and benefit that God bestows upon Noah and all mankind <clears throat> as he commands them to go forth of the ark. Genesis chapter 8, verse 15, And God spake unto Noah, saying, verse 16, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons, and thy sons' wives with thee. Verse number 1 of chapter 9, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. We're beginning to see the relationship of Noah to the ark as our relationship to Jesus Christ and the salvation of our souls. Noah was in an old world that was under the judgment of death. We were in condemnation. We were in dead in trespasses and sins. And God got us out. He got us out through the vessel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone is our hope. And he brought us into a new world. And in that new world, Noah begins to uh, see the of liberty that he has in Christ Jesus or liberty that he has in the new world and we see the liberty that we have in Christ John 10 and verse 9 you shall go in and out and find rest to your souls God is so good a lot of preachers are scared of that word liberty they don't like other preachers using it if they were trying if they were not trying to herd up goats and had sheep they wouldn't worry about it because the Holy Spirit will keep the sheep in line. You don't have to worry about that word liberty. Don't let anybody take it away from you. But don't use it as a, as a cloak to sin either. So he had his liberty. Then he found out that God had a heart. In verse 21, the sacrifice that caused him to be able to offer something uh, sweet-smelling to the Lord God opened up God's heart. And God said in his heart, when you get to be born again and come into the kingdom, you get to know our Father, which art in heaven. Yeah. He becomes personal to you. Amen. It's not just God. Everybody knows God. It's not always the same God. That's a cold religious term. But we come to know our Father. And that makes us a son or a daughter. Amen. Then we looked at verse number 1 of chapter 9. Uh, be fruitful and multiply. And the fruit of the Spirit, uh, there is no one in Christ that does not have the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. By that fruit you shall know them. Men don't gather grapes of, of briars and thorns. And you know a Christian because he has Christ in him. And Christ in your breast acts exactly the same as the Holy Spirit in Jesus of Nazareth's breast. There is no difference. God is good, isn't he? Yeah. We started looking a little bit at the, uh, uh, the beasts in verse number 2 of chapter 9. And uh, we looked at, I believe it was Job uh, chapter 12 and verse 7. Let's read that to get our jumping off place again. Job 12 and verse 7. If all of this is just history, it doesn't do me and you any good to study it. But it's not. It's, it applies spiritually to us. My words are spirit and they are life. Job chapter 12 and verse number 7. But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee. And the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. If I want to know the mysterious working of God, the Holy Spirit, in the soul of mankind, 
I have to study Ezekiel 1.10 and Revelation 4.7. And I find out that in Revelation 4.7, there are four different characteristics of the life of God and the soul of man. One of them is it has the face uh, of, uh, of a man in his benevolence. It has the face of a calf, the ox for service and for sacrifice. Your living sacrifices. The first beast is like a lion in his boldness. And the fourth beast is like a flying eagle. So I need to know about these animals to be able to know about myself. Why would God call me and his work in me of these four things if I don't know anything about them? And you quote that verse in Isaiah uh, 40 and 31, I believe it is, shall mount up with wings as eagles. Sounds good to quote it, but, you know, does that give you anything to live on tomorrow? What does that mean? So we need to understand, let the beasts teach us and see what they have to say to us. Then we looked in Psalm 104 and found out that we have this animal uh, faculty within us and one of them is, as we said, like the lions. And in Psalm 104, verse 21, the young lions roar after their prey and seek their meat from God. So first face was of a lion. Do you seek after that which comes from God? The sun ariseth. They gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. So we get the understanding that they hunt at night. Well, those beast-like thoughts of the flesh love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. John chapter 3. And so it says, Man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening. So that's good that he gets in the house when it's evening because that's when the lions come out. But what about us? Does the real man, one of the faces of the beast in Revelation 4 and verse 7, was the face of the man? God made man in his own image. And when that, that man ceases to work and walk in the spirit, do the lion-like fierce thoughts of lust and sin and all kinds of ungodly things come out on us. You can't have sweet water and bitter water coming out of the same fountain at the same time. So it's up to us to conquer that fierce animal faculty within us, that which is born of the flesh. Guess what? It's always going to be flesh. And it says the spirit lusteth against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. Now, the ideal thing for us is the lion shall lay down with the lamb. So that we come to the ability to conquer that beast-like spirit that's went up within us, that flesh that remains, and uh, we learn to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we come to find out that the animal faculties that were once restrained inside the ark now they're turned loose and we must subdue them and they must be brought into submission. Have you ever read the seventh chapter of Romans? You say, well, I'm not sure. Okay, that that I would do, I do not. That that I say I'm not going to do, that I do. I find then a law within me that when I would do good, evil is present with me. A lot of poor, misinformed people say that's a man that's lost, that's unsaved. No, it's not. That's you when you first got saved. You come out of the ark. You know, when you first got saved, you was on your honeymoon. Everything was great. Heaven had just come down into your soul. There was not going to be any problems. Everybody's going to love what you had to say about Jesus. You were just going to go straight on into heaven right then. Next thing you know, wham. No line like thought. No wicked thought comes in. You say, where did that come from? I thought I was through with all that. Mm -mm. 
those things that are restrained in the ark, when you're in Christ and you're coming forth from him and then you, you're newly born again, you feel like nothing will ever be wrong again in your heart and life. And the first time you have a lustful thought, bam, it buckles you to your knees and the warfare is on. And there you go. So those animal faculties that were restrained in the ark, now that they're let loose, they have to be brought under submission. Psalm 73, very familiar psalm. You know old Asaph. I like him. He's a symbol playing Levite. And he begins to write and talk about his problem in Psalm 73. And he says in verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel. He says, I want to get this down first. Before I start complaining about God, I want you to know, you know God's really good. So don't strike me with lightning, Lord, while I talk about you. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as of a clean heart. But, as for me, this thing almost knocked me down. My feet were almost gone. My steps were well nigh slipped. Well, if God's so good to you, what is this that's bothering you? Verse 3, I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. In verse number 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. How do you handle these kinds of thoughts? How do you handle these wild animals that cause your feet to slip? How do you do this when you know God is good, yet you still got to contend with this warfare that's within you? Hold on just a minute. First, that's 1 Corinthians 2.14. I tried to quote it. I want you to see this in your Bible. I want to see it, you to see it in your mind's eye. <clears throat> that ain't what I want. But it sounds good in here. 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can they know them, because they are spiritually discerned. I want that verse where it says the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, so that you cannot do what you would. Okay, I just quoted that that's good enough. Back to Psalm 73. All right, I'm not going to spend time looking for verses tonight. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. What do you do when these beast-like thoughts come to you? What do you do when you see the prosperity of the wicked? You see them, you know, they don't have a care. He goes on to say their eyes bulge out with fatness. They get everything they want. And, you know, every time I turn around, I'm getting knocked down. Verse number 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Where were these beast-like faculties restrained? In the ark of God. So why not go back to that place where these things are restrained and go back into Christ. Don't stand outside and look at these things and, and, and let them drive you crazy. Get into Christ again. Lord, these are your servants. I don't care how mean or, or fierce they are. It makes no difference. They don't scare God. They are your servants and you're using them for my good. So you come back to the sanctuary of God. Listen, then understood I therein. Now, before he understood therein, what kind of shape was he in? Verse 22. Would you read it for me, please? The Christian can be as a beast before God, laboring against the things of God's absolute sovereignty. We really pride ourselves in knowing Romans 8, 28. <clears throat> but we're only talking about memorizing. We're not talking about knowing it. It starts off, and we know. But I want to say, but we really don't. Because the way we quote Romans 8, 28 to our own hearts is, we know that all good things work together for my good. That's not what it says. It says, and we know that all things work together 
for good to them that love the Lord and are the call according to his purpose. You've got to get back into the sanctuary. You've got to get back into the awareness of God and his glory. You've got to see that these are sanctified afflictions. Some of the, uh, the Pentecostals and some of the, uh, I forgot what you used to call them, I've been away from charismatics. They say the Christian has no sicknesses, they have no problems. And I said, where are you been? You know, where are you, you've been living on Mars, I don't know where you're coming from. And, and they, they say, and you can't have problems if you're in Christ. And I'm saying this, you most assuredly will have problems in Christ. But what you need to do is pray that God would sanctify those afflictions. That's what we need. Sanctified afflictions. What does that mean? Praying in an awareness of God. Lord, you're Alpha and Omega. You started it. You will end it. He that begun a good work in you will perform it. It's not going to go on one minute or one second or one day or one month longer than it's supposed to. And you will, it will, with the temptation, make the way of escape that you might be able to bury it. And there's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able. There's all kinds of safeguards in this thing. But we are going through it. Acts 14 and verse 22, you need not turn there because I'm going to misquote it and I don't want you to see it. They came back through confirming all the churches where they had preached and they told them we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. That's how it is. So we are to seek God's help in the sanctuary of God that these things might be sanctified and that God would help us to endure it. And all he's going to do is use it to bring us to a greater place of of uh, holiness and uh, spirituality through these things. Now, we also have all reminded you before in Acts chapter 10 when, when God let that sheet down to Peter while he was on the roof in Joppa and it had, uh, had exactly the same description in, in the sheet as God describes that Noah should take into the ark. There was animals, all kind of beasts, and creeping things is just an identical inventory of what God said was in the ark. That was what was in that sheet. And Peter was starving to death. Yeah, he could smell them cooking downstairs and he was really hungry and God put him in a trance and wouldn't let him go to lunch. And he said, rise, kill and eat. And Peter was more holy than God was. I don't do that. I don't eat things like that. God says, well, I'm going to tell you something. You could eat what I put on your plate, and that what God has cleansed by the blood of the Lamb of God. I'm not bound up under the law's dietary uh, menus anymore. Might be better if you were for your health. But anyhow, I'm not under that anymore. That which I have cleansed, don't you ever, ever, ever again call it common and unclean. Three times he had to do it to him. If you'll get down to verse 28 in Acts chapter 10, when Peter gets into Cornelius' house, here's how he interprets it. He said, you know that it's not lawful for me, a Jew, to be in the house of a Gentile. But God has showed me not to call any man common or unclean. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. What was in that sheet? Beasts, animals, fowl of the air, creeping things. There wasn't a man in that sheet. God was showing Peter that cleansed men are beast-like before God gets a hold of them. And now you are to walk among them and not be afraid. The first Christian terrorist was the Apostle Paul. His name was Saul of Tarsus. Everybody in Christendom hated him and was afraid of him, and he was killing people and throwing them in jail, busted up families. It, it, it was awful. He was, he was the worst terrorist the world had ever known. And that's who turned out to write two-thirds of your Bible. Beast, cleansed, don't call him common and unclean. That's your brother. In fact, he's your boss. Because apostles are above pastors and teachers. 
He's my boss. I can't say anything he didn't say. He didn't authorize. And he had to get everything from his boss, Jesus Christ. So there's a beast that God turned into a blessing. And if we would admit it, we ourselves wasn't such a hot, hot shot before we got saved either. Amen? Somebody say amen. amen. All right then. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 7. I got started looking at this today, and it just abs absorbed me. It just drew me into it. I never had considered it before. Why did God not allow the Israelites to destroy all the Canaanites in one fell swoop? In Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 22, and the Lord thy God <clears throat> will put out those nations before thee by little and little. That's exactly what he promised Moses in Exodus 23, 29, and 30. He said, I'm just, that's what I'm going to do. But he didn't tell you in Exodus 23, 29, and 30 why he was going to do it. But here he does. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, would you, for your own sake and to impress you, read me the rest of the verse. Why did God do that? Lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. Mm -mm -mm. Now what are you going to do that, Mr. Smart Alec Preacher? How are you going to type that out? Well, I'm going to tell you that God in humankind puts morality in society in, 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 and so that the beasts of these lusts and all give the true Christian opportunity to grow and to come on to Christ. I've told you many times you can be moral and not be righteous. But I have told you also, I don't want the world to be without morality. So the human beings, made in the image of God, are going to keep down the ferocity of the animals so that you don't have to war against those terrible beasts that would surely consume you. So there is that common grace in a society wherein people act moral and they act more like human beings than animals. Some people just act like animals anyhow. You don't have to go too far in the Bible to read about dogs and sows. Right. But the Lord would have a society of morality to deal with its through its blue laws and so forth and the the police force and the court system and so forth uh, that it might keep a moral society in order for God's church to prosper. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter two and verse number one. Excuse me, I did it again. First Timothy chapter two and verse number one. Hang in there, we'll try to get you to the right place before it's over with. Maybe midnight before we get out, but we will. First Timothy two one. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks finish the verse for me do you hear that pray for everybody why because those who are human beings and are more moral will help keep the ungodly unruly beast like immorality out of your society Pray for all men, 
for kings and for all that are in authority. Now, again, why? Can you finish verse number two? For kings and for all that are in authority. I'll rest my case. That's the whole message tonight. Pray for the society in which you live. Everybody. In order that the church might live a quiet and peaceful life. Don't kill out all the Canaanites. Some of those guys are really good at killing lions. And don't throw rocks at those people who are dealing with only in morality and know nothing about imputed righteousness because God in his wisdom is using them to keep away the kind of society you don't want to live in. I don't care what Tarzan says. I'm, he, I don't want to live with a bunch of monkeys and apes and gorillas and baboons and, and tigers and lions and all that stuff. That's just pure fantasy. God said... Pray for the humans that they keep down the beasts so the church can live a, a quiet and peaceful life. These people do practice a moral restraint. Isaiah 43 and verse 4. The book of Isaiah, chapter 43. Then verse 4. You know, you say, I've got some real good friends, but they don't know the Lord. You're talking about sanctified Canaanites. You say, you know, they, he's been faithful to his wife, and that him and his wife raised those children right, and they're moral, and you can trust them if they won't lie to you, and they're always honest, and they'll, you know, they'll help you if you need it, but they don't know the Lord. Pray for them. God may not save them. Listen to this verse right here. He may not have ever intended to save them. Listen. Isaiah 43, 4. Since thou, Israel, the church, was precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I, have, I personally have loved thee personally. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. That's 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. You may have had a good boss that you went in that company young and green as a gourd. And he, as it were, took, he, took you under his wing and took care of you, trained you up. Now you're knowledgeable in, what, uh, in that employment. And it's all according. It's all a, a, a response to him, on account of him and what he did for you. And he may not know God from third base. You see what I'm saying? The beasts are kept down by a moral society, so that the church can have some breathing room. Look at Genesis 14 and verse 13. And I wish Gary Bowley was here. Because he could read these jawbreaker names. Well, this ain't too bad. That's what we keep him around for so he can pronounce all them names. Genesis 14 and verse 13. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eschol, and brother of Aner. Listen. And these were confederate with Abram. <laughs> Have you ever heard of any of those guys? Do you know any of those locations? Do you know what that means? It means that Abraham was in this world all alone, just him and God. And there was Canaanites all around him. And this is before Joshua was invented to come with his sword and kill him. I mean, it's way back yonder. And if he sneezed wrong, get his head cut off. But what did God do? I just read it to you in Isaiah 43 and verse 4. He gave these people around Abraham and surrounded them with like a comfort zone, a buffer zone. They were his confederates. They were good neighbors. They were good friends. They were people he could trust in and rely on. They benefited from his light and salt of the earth. They, and he benefited from their respect 
and they're making sure that morality reigns so that he could thrive and prosper. I don't know that any of these guys ever knew God. Can't prove it by the scriptures. Genesis 15 and verse 16. Genesis 15 and verse 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. Abraham, your children are going to come out of Egypt in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. I'm going to destroy them once their iniquity is full. Not until. Well, what's going on with the Amorites now? I don't know. But God's protecting them. And they're living their normal lives. And what did he have to do with Israel but put them under Pharaoh and put them in bondage and keep them over here out of the way because he didn't want the Amorites killed yet? Why? Because they hadn't become so immoral that God had to cut them off the earth. So God maintains a common grace among human beings to provide the church with a comfort zone that you might live a quiet and peaceful life and live out your faith in Jesus Christ. Ain't God good? Dear soul, do you understand that the devil would have every rock and every pine straw and, 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 and every squirrel to be your enemy and he would love to turn everything there is in the world against you and destroy you. You realize he only comes to kill and steal and destroy. That's it. He's, he's furious and fierce and capable of murder and shedding blood, destroying you. But God, as it were, Builds a hedge around you. You got some good neighbors. You got some good co workers. You may be even fortunate enough to have some good people in your family. Yeah, I don't know, but maybe that's stretching it. But whatever you've got, it's God taking care of the wild beasts that would absolutely eat you alive if it were not for the human beings that are made in the image of God. Is God good or what? Yes. My soul. Matthew 13 and verse number 30. This verse, when it became a reality in my life, it put me in the same tailspin Asaph was in. And I said, Lord, surely that can't be. And that one word in this verse really got to me. And then the second word right behind it, really hurt my feelings. Matthew 13 and verse number 30. Said, Master, these tares uh, sowed all, these weeds sowed all in your wheat. You want us to go out there and pull it up? Nope. Because the roots are interlocked. You pull up tares, you'll pull up wheat with it. God said there'd be five in a family, be two saved and three lost, or there'd be three saved and two lost. That's the Bible. Look it up. What are you going to do? How are you going to tell who is lost and who ain't lost? How are you going to tell who's saved and who ain't saved? How are you going to tell who's elect and who ain't? Leave it alone. One reason you need to leave it alone is this word that bothered me for so many years. Matthew 13, 30. Let both one word. Right. Now, I add the next word to it. Uh, wait, wait, Lord, don't you know these tares are driving me crazy? Son, they good for you. <laughs> I need to tell you something, Lord. <laughs> like I'm going to teach God something. But I'll give people for thy life. They're sanctified afflictions. And they're going to grow together with you. And we saw that in the book of Hebrews where the sun shines and the plants rise up and some of them come up tares and wheat. I mean, some of them come up tares and some of them come up wheat. And the word of God is distilled among you and, and, and some of it is just briars and thorns. And you know, for, there's no sense us turning there. We, we wore it out reading it. First Corinthians 2. First John chapter 2 verse 18. Where did the Antichrist come from? From among us. 
Because it takes the gospel to grow an antichrist as much as it does a Christian. You can't apostatize from that which you've never professed. And the gospel is necessary to make a reprobate. They've got to turn from or they couldn't be apostates. So you sit on the same bench together, you go and hear the same message together, you have the same Bible together, and you take sweet counsel together and walk up to the house of God together, and, you know, butter won't melt in their mouth. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened, but somebody threw a switch, and they turned out to be the worst enemy I ever had. A man that we used to ride together, and I shined his shoes. We'd get ready to go to the meeting. I'd get his shoes out and shine them the same time as I did mine. I loved him. Helped him. Did everything I could. He told more, told, told more lies on me than any ten men I know of. Despises me. Hates me. But we used to take sweet counsel and walk up to the house of God together. Tears, folks. Beasts out there. Mm. Let both grow together until the harvest and in time of harvest I say to the reapers I will say to the reapers gather ye together first the tares that'll mess up your eschatology and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn so we see dear soul that there is a growing of tares that is essential for your maturity under the same sunshine and rain, the same gospel and spirit that you have had. And Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 through 6 says, they also tasted the heavenly gift. That's the Holy Ghost. How much of the Holy Ghost can you taste and still go to hell? I don't know. But tasting of something is not like he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood. You need it all the time. They just want a little taste of it. They sat on the same gospel you did. It grew them up. But when the fruit appeared, then appeared the tares also. <clears throat> if you look at verse number 20 of this chapter, Matthew 13, In verse number 20, he, but he that one word receiveth. receiveth. Now they did receive, but he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and just like you, and non with joy, next word, receiveth. Receive it. it tells you twice they received the word. They were just as happy about getting saved as you was. But they didn't really get saved. Yet hath he not root in himself, but he endureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Get ready again. Verse 22. He also that receive seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word just like you did but the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful they have a morality but they don't have any righteousness there is nothing enduring in them only the true believer will never finally fall away chapter 5 of Matthew in verse number 20. Matthew 5 and verse number 20. Here is the difference between the human beings with morality <clears throat> and the true church with righteousness. Matthew 5, 20. But I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed, and in italics, the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. But you see, theirs is not really a righteousness. They label it righteousness, but it's not. 
being honest about it, there is a morality that they have. And God said, I understand that religious folks are very strenuous about rules and regulations. We don't smoke and we don't chew and we don't go with the ones that do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're going to hell without tobacco on your breath. So what? And God says there are then those religious people who have what they consider to be a righteousness. That's those humans in Deuteronomy 7, 22, that you are not to destroy because they will help weed out the immorality of the fierceness of the beasts that would consume the church. So we, we see in verse 43, the difference between the humans who have morality and the true church who has righteousness. Ye have heard, where did we hear it? From the old harlot church we grew up in. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That's their morality. But I say, here's the spiritual. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do get them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, in order that you may be seen to be the children of your Father which is in heaven, who lets his Son shine on those evil moralists as well as on those good righteous. And it goes on down, all the way down to verse 48, be ye perfect even as your Father. And so the perfection comes from an imputed righteousness. For he, God the Father, hath made him, God the Son, to be sin for us. That's imputation. He knew no sin. He had no sin. It had to be put into his account. And it's only those sins that were put into Christ's account that he has made us to be the righteousness of God in him. Your perfection as a Christian is as perfect as the perfection in the breast of Jesus Christ tonight. If it ain't, then what kind of salvation do you have? Bargain basement righteousness? Seconds, you know, well, let's go over here. They sell these seconds, and sometimes you can find stuff just as good as the original. God don't sell no seconds. God don't make no junk. You say, well, I don't feel that righteous. I don't think you ever will. Not till you get your new glorified body. But what kind of righteousness did God give you? The righteousness of God. In him. What are you going to do with that verse that says, That which is born of God sinneth not? You say, Well, I sin every day. Well, I'll top that. I sin every minute. But we ain't talking about how I feel in the flesh. I'm talking about what God made me in the spirit. Wake up. Wake up. God ain't fooling around. You either have Christ's righteousness or you don't. That's all there is to it. And that righteousness is a pure and a holy righteousness. It's the righteousness of God. So there are those that have a form of godliness, but they don't have the power of God. There are those that have a righteousness that must be exceeded and is easily exceeded by the Holy Ghost. You say, well, you know, they, they, they paid tithe of every tenth, you know, little speck of pepper. Every time they put salt on the plate, they took the tenth grain of salt and gave it to God. I, I can't do that. You're in the wrong ball field. <coughs> Your righteousness is not what you do. It's what God has done for you. You're not saved if you don't have Christ's righteousness. If you have Christ's righteousness, quit fooling around with it. The power of Christ's righteousness will form your works. I don't know when you're ever going to hear this. 
You don't give apples in order to become an apple tree. Hello, hello, hello. What's the next? You give. Come on, say it. You give apples because you are. Bing. When are you going to make that application to yourself? You can't do righteousness. It's imputed. You either got it or you don't. And what you do comes from that. That's the source. Your activity is the course. I can't exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Well, I can. Because I've got Christ's righteousness imputed to me. That exceeds all righteousness. That's as holy as God is holy. That's the only kind of salvation God knows about. But we have been so brainwashed by the whole church that we think we don't do enough and we're not accepted. <coughs> Friend, justification by works is abomination to God Almighty. Justification by faith is glorification of Jesus Christ. God's going to take care of this thing. I don't know why I got into all that. Maybe somebody needed it. Now, Psalm 1 and verse 4. How close are we associated with these Canaanites? Psalm 1 and verse 4. Four. The ungodly are not so, but are like the what? Chaff. The chaff. <clears throat> now, look at me. What is this? A hand. A hand. What is this? A fist. A fist. But it's the same thing. Right? This is a, a hand. hand. This is a fist. fist. Same thing. The chaff used to be the outer covering of the wheat. Why is it chaff now? Because it's been separated from the wheat. The chaff was the outer covering on every grain of wheat. And God says individuals are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And so we come to see that that which at one time grew up out of the ground as wheat that was so attached to the wheat itself that you just said, that's wheat. That's a hand. But harvest time comes and you harvest it and they used to take shovels, pitchforks, whatever, paddles, I don't know, and find them a windy place, spread out of a sheet out there, throw it up in the air, and that which used to be a hand now becomes a fist, that which used to be part of the wheat now becomes chaff, and the wind blows it away because it's real light and the wheat's heavy, it falls right back down where, it's, where you want it. So chaff can be individuals, but also chaff can be nations. Look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 35. Get ready to read three words. He's talking about this image and how many different nations it represents. And he says, Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold. That's all the different nations. Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold and so forth, Babylon and all, broken to pieces together and became three words. Like the chaff. Chaff is also nations. They are chaff nations. They are chaff people. And God has raised them up at the time that he has ordained them to be raised up to fit his church for more spiritual maturity. 
And so not only are individuals, Psalm 1-4, like chaff, but nations are like chaff. Daniel 2.35, like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carrieth them away. The Holy Spirit blows them away. That no place was found for them. You don't have to deal with Nebuchadnezzar or Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great. But you got your own chaff you're having to deal with. And the stone that smote the image, that's Christ, became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So we see, dear soul, they are to grow together. And God takes care of you. Now, one thing you need to be aware of, and that is when human beings come to be like beasts. Do you know who Paul said he fought with at Ephesus in 1 Corinthians 15, 32? He said, I fought with the beasts at Ephesus. You turn in your Bible, not now, to Acts chapter 19 and read who those beasts were. And it was Demetrius the silversmith. But he calls them beasts of Ephesus. You be careful. Because like the example I gave you personally earlier, you may have somebody that you grew together with that turned into a beast and turned on you and would have devoured you had God hadn't separated you from them. Mm. And remember what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2. It would have been better for them never to know the ways of God and the ways of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from it. And the proverb is true to them. They have become like dogs and sows. He said the true proverb, they have become like dogs running, returning to their vomit and sows returning to their wallowing in the mire. There are some men that turn back into beasts and develop on into an ungodliness. And be, we ought to be thankful that all men don't do that. But like Abram, there are those that we confederate with. God may be giving men for our life. You ready for your homework? We don't have time for this. Our time is gone. I'm going to give you some homework. Let me read this one verse, then I'll give you homework. Second Samuel. Second Samuel 23. And verse 30. About all I'm going to be able to do is read you this because I don't know if I can unravel all this for you or not. We don't have time anyhow. Second Samuel 23. And I said 30, but I meant 20. Second Samuel 23, 20. And Benah... He's listing all the great men of David in his army. The son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two, what? Lion-like men. Two lion-like men of Moab. If you look up that word lion-like, it's going to make you scratch your head. And don't come to me because I just told you I don't want to talk about this because I don't understand it. I'm just going to tell you what it says. It says lions of God. The powerful men. There are those who are lion-like men and you need to be careful with them. Here's your homework. You ready? Pencil and piece of paper. First one is Numbers 22. Verse 27 through 31. <clears throat> Sometimes animal faculties are given visions, given a vision that the man does not have. What is Numbers 22, 27 through 31? It's where Balaam's ass saw God standing in the way and Balaam didn't. Gary taught us here not too long ago, Matthew 10, 16, be wise as what? 
Mm-hmm. The beast has something to teach you, but be harmless as a dove. Luke 16, 18. Gosh, I can't remember what that is. Got to look it up real quick. Luke 16, 18. Sometimes the animal has sight that you don't have. Luke 16 and verse 18. Is that what I want? No, I did it again. Luke 16 and verse 8. It ain't that I need new glasses. It's that I need a new brain. And the Lord commended the unjust, unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world, unregenerate lost people, are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And again, I ain't got time to unravel that. You'll have to deal with it yourself. But the other one is this. 1 Kings 13, verse 20 through 25. The animal can be used to cause death to the disobedient child of God. And the animal wasn't hungry. He didn't kill him to eat him. God told the young prophet, you go yonder, tell him what I said, come straight back. Don't stop anybody's house. The old prophet comes out and said, God told me to tell you, you're supposed to stop at my house. Dear soul, if God said don't stop there, I don't care who said what, you do what God said. Right. He went on in and ate with a man, left the next morning, the lion killed him. And the lion didn't kill him to eat him because he was just standing there beside him. Didn't kill his donkey either. You'll read it, 1 Kings chapter, what did I say, 13, verse 20 through 25. God's, God's watching over you. This, these, these animal-like faculties are under the sovereign, absolute control of Almighty God. They're not going to bother you. They're going to help you. God's going to take care of you in this, but you better obey God. Hmm. In Daniel 6, 28, some of these people like Cyrus reign in order that we might prosper. Why did Potiphar have a blessed house? Because Joseph was in it. God looks after some people in order to take care of you. And God said, you're going to have authority over the beast of the field, the fowl there. I don't care if it's spiritual, heavenly. Files are there, or the earthly, whatever it is, in every scope, fish under the water, maybe a world you ain't used to. Maybe you couldn't survive in it. God says, I'm still going to take care of you through that. Nothing can hurt you, friend. It's just here to help you. It may hurt your feelings. Matthew 13, 30 hurt my feelings for a long time. Growing together with me, I don't like it. Get them out of here. Mm-mm. You are better off with a sanctified tear and a sanctified affliction than you are without. God have mercy. Thank you. You've been very patient.